Amen. Good morning. Let's talk for a minute, okay? Because I, I noticed something as I'm, I'm sitting back there, and it's this. I don't think you all know how to clap very well. I'm just throwing that out there. So if you were watching online, you didn't get to see what was in the room, but they weren't sure whether they were to a, applaud or clap along to the song. And I'm not one to tell you how to do this. And so someone way smarter and way better than I am, because you sounded like you started clapping like I would normally clap, like I'm clap. But anyway, so you guys got to laugh a little. We're in some weird times, right? And so it's, it's kind of weird. And you're having to walk around with face masks on and you're having to go into stores with face masks on. And I wonder how many of you have left home and have left your face mask at home only to have to turn around and go get it. Is anybody in that? Okay, so there's a few of us in the room. I've had to do that a couple of times myself. Uh, I've gotten in the car at different times only to look at my wife who keeps a whole bag of them with her and say, hey, do you have the face masks? And of course, she is prepared and ready And she says, yes, I have the extra ones. And so we are in some weird times. And you probably never imagined a day in your life that this would happen to you. Uh, Because I know that I didn't. So uh, it's okay. It's going to be okay. I want to remind you that it's just a season. There will be some point where this, this too shall pass. And so just be patient um, and I know everybody's got an opinion about those things. That's okay, too. Everybody's entitled to their opinion. You're not necessarily entitled to force your opinion on everybody else, but whatever. Um, anyway, we want to talk this morning about post-quarantine, right? And so one of the things that you realize today is, is the, uh, a lot of people are very stressed. Have you noticed that? There's a lot of people, and people handle stress differently. And so I, I looked back in the American Psychological Association, and I don't I don't know if any of you are a, a, a member of that group, but they did some studies over the last several years, and I want to I want to just talk for a minute about that. So in 2014, so rewind uh, six years, and in 2014, the top stresses in somebody's life was job was number one. That was their top stress. Their their job number two was money, and number three was health. That's six years ago. Job, money, health. From 2014, when you fast forward to 2017, which in case you need a little reminder, that's after the election of 2016, um, there was a little change in top stressors for people. And so in 2017, the top top stressors, uh, the number one top stressor was the future of our nation for the people that they surveyed. That was then the top stressor. Number two was really it's within 1%, but it was um, money and work. Those things really went together in 2017 as they did that study. And then the next one for them was the political climate was the next top stressor. And, And I don't know necessarily how you feel about things today, but I would imagine on some level you are feeling stressed. I think most of us are. Um, and, and it may, it may center with your job. It may be with your family. It may be with the future. It may be with the coming election this year and all the things that are happening in our world and in our country. And you just aren't quite sure what to do or even quite how to handle it. One of the things that we discovered, if you were to do just kind of this quick Google search, because that's sometimes how you can do some research, uh, you would find a couple of these top headlines um, about stress today. And one of them is this, that most of us stress about the future of our nation, and it's at the highest uh, that's ever been reported. And so if you pay any attention to the political climate right now, and I don't care if you're a Republican or Democrat, I mean, if you pay any attention to the political climate at this point, you are one of those people who's sitting here going, man, um, the future of our nation, that is a stressor for me. Uh, the second thing that uh, happens for a lot of people is that the government response, the government's response to coronavirus is a significant stressor for a majority of Americans. The government's response, and, and I, again, I'm not trying to wade into the how do you feel about government and local government, or big, that just for a lot of people, how those the officials who are in charge and their response is a stressor, and then, and then for, for parents, if you're a parent in the room, and even grandparents, like for you, you are stressing about the long-term impacts of, of what this means for your kids. 
not necessarily from a health perspective, but from an emotional perspective, from an educational perspective. All of those things come into play. And so let's just admit that a lot of people that we know um, are stressed out at this point. And so what I did was, I have these, these cute little things. One is, if you're a kid in the room, you got a little bag, hopefully from our children's ministry team, and you actually had a stress ball in there this morning, didn't it? or a stressy thing. Anybody got one of those that looks like this, Jesus loves you? Nobody's got that. I may have stolen the last one from the kids, and I apologize for that. So anyway, and then I just, I picked up a couple of these this week, and so this one's just a stress ball, and it says, focus, listen, and breathe. So what I want to do is, I want to know who in here thinks they are the most stressed out right now, today? Who's the most stressed out person in the room? I want to help you. Anybody willing to admit it? Nobody. Who's the biggest liar in the room? Let's just go there. Who's the biggest? First hand that went up right over there. So, but but, but I want you to think about stress for a minute, because really with post-quarantine, what you think about is um, you're stuck, like things are different. So we're not necessarily quarantined to your house, although there are people that maybe should be quarantined to their house. But the, the regular rhythm that you used to have six months ago, you don't have anymore. And some of you have taken advantage of that. So some of you uh, in your life, you've begun to establish some really good rhythms. And so you're one of those folks that you're out there walking regularly. You're on your bike regularly. You're reading your Bible regularly. You're doing all of these things because you have maybe a little more time than you used to have. Maybe you're working from home when you used to go to the office. And because you're working from home, you're able to establish some different rhythms in your life. Now, there's other people who are having trouble establishing rhythms. And so they're the people that are going to the refrigerator or the freezer and they're grabbing that whole quart of ice cream and they're finishing it off every night and they're going to the pantry and they're wiping out all of the extra snacks that they might have in the room. And and what it is, is they have kind of this different rhythm. They're coping differently with the stress that they have. What I want to encourage you with over the next few weeks is that At some point, this season that we find ourselves in right now is going to be over. And you have an opportunity in your life right now to establish some different rhythms. Because see, stress in your life is going to bring these five different things. Stress in your life brings irritability. Are any of you irritable? Maybe ask the person that's with you this morning if you're irritable. Are any of you anxious? You, you struggle with anxiety. Uh, are any of you battling depression? And you may not even want to acknowledge that. But in this season, you may find yourself in a lonely place. And loneliness, a lot of times, will lead to depression. Are you suffering? One of the physical things that comes with stress is uh, you have headaches. You have insomnia. You're unable to sleep. And all of those things. And what will happen is those will just plague you and get worse and worse and worse in your life. But if you will choose to maybe establish some different rhythms, it will help you as you keep moving forward and you find yourself on the other side of this season. Because God, here's the thing you realize, is God has something more for you. He's using this moment. He's using what you're going through and what you're facing right now, and he can mold and shape you and help you even in the middle of it. So one of the things that I enjoy um, actually in my life is I enjoy reading books about business, and I don't know if that's something that you enjoy. Um, I I really got started reading that with Good to Great by Jim Collins uh, years and years and years ago, and then it's just sort of developed into I love reading about businesses, the rise and fall of businesses, the success of businesses, all those types of things. And one of the books that I've read during this season uh, is a book by Michael Hyatt. It's, it's called The Vision Driven Leader. But in that book, he talks, he tells the story about Steve Jobs. Now, do any of you know who Steve Jobs is? Two people know who Steve Jobs. Come on, guys, it's okay. Okay, so we, we have Steve Jobs because let's, I mean, Steve Jobs is, is, he's actually, he's not alive anymore, but, but he did some pretty incredible things. But, you know, in the, in the 1980s, he was the founder of Apple when the board of Apple decided to kick him out. He got fired from his job. And uh, Apple went from basically this, this mid-level company at that point to actually getting worse. 
And in, in uh, kind of a, a weird turn of events, the board decided that one of the things that they should do is they should bring Steve Jobs back to Apple. And Steve Jobs, as he came back to Apple, a lot of, a lot of things had changed in his life at that point. Um, but he led Apple to what it now is as a company and its current prominence in the market, right? But one of the things that Steve Jobs did is as he entered back into Apple, he began to look at the things that they were doing and the projects that they had in place. And he began to stop working on them. And, and Steve Jobs goes back and he actually has this quote. He says, I'm as proud of many of the things we haven't done as the things we have done. And he talks, innovation is saying no to a thousand things. You see, Apple had started trying to develop all of these different things. And when Steve Jobs came back in, he wanted to help them focus And so he started to say and help them as a company to say no to a lot of really good ideas so that they could get to the really great ideas like um, the um, iPhone, like the iPod. That's where it all started. And if you remember those early days and you wanted an iPod and you wanted to have a thousand songs in your pocket, so to speak, is the way that he presented that. But he had to say no to a lot of really good things in order to get to that thing. And then that iPod led us to the iPhone, which has completely changed most of our lives. And most of our lives, I say, because I would imagine that there's somebody in this room who still has a flip phone. Who is it? Who has a flip phone that's in the room? Are they in the room? Are they in the room? He's in the back. He's on the back wall. He's trying to hide. He's sitting in a dark spot and I can't see him. But he's got a flip phone. In fact, he was texting me from it earlier. So it's kind of this joke that we have. But for most people, you have an iPhone or you might have a Samsung or an Android device. You might be a green bubble person instead of a blue bubble person. And I'm sorry about that. All of those types of things. But in order to get to the iPhone, they had to say no to a lot of really good things. And in your life, you are going to have to make decisions. And you are in a space and you are in a season of your life where you have the opportunity to decide what are the rhythms that you are going to establish. Because you hear, don't you hear stories about families and they're sitting around the dinner table for the first time in years because they're not running here, there, and everywhere playing all kinds of different sports and doing all kinds of different things. You hear of, uh, of people who have started exercise routines and they're working out and doing all those sorts of things because they have just a little more space in their schedule. What are you willing to say no to What habit and what rhythm are you willing to establish so that when you get to the other side of this season, so that you are a stronger follower of Jesus? And that's what we want to talk about today. Specifically, we want to talk about just developing spiritual rhythms in your life. And here's what I promise. You're going to walk out of here and you're going to go, I knew all of those things that pastor said today. I am not going to share with you anything that's new under the sun. I'm going to share with you things that you've known your entire spiritual life, however long that journey's been. Stuff that people have told you for years, but I want to break it down really simply for you. I believe right now that you have the opportunity to develop three different rhythms in your life around a spiritual rhythm. And the first one is real simple. It's this, develop a rhythm of reading the Bible. Develop a rhythm of reading the Bible. And, and here's, here's where I go. Psalm 1 is a, a chapter of the, uh, the Bible that I memorized a long, long time ago. Uh, but it's really, really just this really great picture of, of what being a person, a man or woman, or even a child or a student of the word of God will do for you. And it says this, Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join with mockers, which by the way, um, it's one of the great challenges we face today, isn't it? 
You see, it used to be that you could go to the town center, and this is where all that stuff was happening, but we have it on every electronic device except for the gentleman who has a flip phone in the back of the room. But for most of us, we have, we have these things on every device. We have those three descriptions, the advice of the wicked, we stand around with sinners, and we join in with mockers, and we can have access to that 24-7 on a little screen that's in the palm of our hand. And for a lot of people... That's all that they're putting into their life. And they're, they're never coming to the other place where God's going, I have so much more for you. I have so much more in store for you. You see, a lot of times it's all of that stuff that you're pouring in that's causing the anxiousness and insomnia and the thoughts. And you wonder where in the world is the peace of God? Well, the peace of God's going to be found in the Word of God. And so the, the Psalm 1, the writer of this psalm, is he's really comparing two different people. And, and he, he's talking about this person that delights in God's Word versus the person who's having the world and the ideals of the world being poured into them day and night. And so he gets this place, he says, but they delight in the law of the Lord meditating on it. Day and night, and night and day. Now here's the thing, and it's going to be weird. Meditation, it's not sitting around, um, like sitting down, like um, crisscross applesauce with your fingers going like this, or whatever, and humming. And no, that's not what meditating is. Meditating is thinking and pondering on the things of God. That's what real meditation is. And so if you will be someone who develops the rhythm of reading the Word of God, if you will develop the rhythm of reading the Bible, you will stand a better chance of being someone who meditates on it day and night. Because you're reading it, and you're reading it every day, and so you're thinking about the things that you read. I'm not saying you've got to sit and read for hours and hours and hours. But as you develop the rhythm of being in the Bible, you will recall those things to mind and you will begin to think about, your mind will become saturated with his word. It's like this. So one of the things that I've started doing in the last few weeks is I started reading through the gospel of Luke. Um, I don't know what led me to Luke. I just started reading the gospel of Luke. Just in my own time, it, it's usually sometime in the mornings before noon. I just want to say that. It's before noon. It's not 4 a.m., I don't get up at 4 a.m. Some of you get up at 4 a.m. and I applaud you. I don't. But sometime before noon, I like to sit down and I like to have this quiet moment where I can just read. And I'm reading the Gospel of Luke. And I'm not journaling through the Gospel of Luke. I am just simply reading the Gospel of Luke. I'm not even hardly highlighting or underlining anything. Which for those who know me, you know that that's rare. I like to underline a lot of things. But I'm just reading it. And some, some days I open it up and I'm looking at it, and I'm like, I can't quite remember if I read that chapter, so I'll read it again. And then I'll read the next chapter. I'm just reading, like the rhythm of reading the Word of God, the rhythm of reading the Bible. And then as I'm reading it, it's like I'm, I'm thinking about the things that I've read. So this morning, just give me an example. So this morning I, I get up, and I fix myself um, eggs, which is usually what I have in the mornings for breakfast, and I fix my eggs, and I sit down at the counter. I got my Bible, and I got my breakfast, and I'm just sitting there, and I'm reading the chapter in Luke. I think it's Luke 11 or 12 I was in today. I don't remember exactly. But Jesus was talking about the rich man, and he was talking about how hard it is for the rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven, right? In the pursuit of riches, and, and this is what, what really got me this morning was he talked about you, you can have this choice that you can pursue worldly riches or you can pursue a rich relationship with God. And I thought, oh, I, I hadn't really seen that before. It, but Jesus is, it, he's just offering, he's going, here it is. Like, here's the choice that you have. You can have a rich relationship with the world. You can have a rich relationship with everybody around you. You can have a great relationship with your family. You can pursue everything that the world has to offer. Or, Jesus is going, or 
you can have a rich relationship with your heavenly Father. The choice is yours, and the choice is mine. And so guess what? I get to think about that. That's what meditation is for me. It's over the course of the next day until I dig into the next chapter or I reread that chapter. I'm just going to think about it. I'm going to think about what does that mean for me? How does that play out in my life? So as you develop just this rhythm, just read the Bible. Pick a book of the Bible and just read it and then read it again. If it's a short book like the book of Philippians or the book of Colossians, they have four chapters. Read those four chapters every day for a month. But develop the rhythm, the habit of just reading God's Word. Put into your life what will combat everything that's out there in the world. And it will begin to change your mindset. It really will. So um, that's the first one. Next one. Again, really simple. Develop a rhythm of prayer. Turn to the gospel of Luke chapter four. I just told you I've been reading through the gospel of Luke. There's a couple of things that have struck me as I've read through it. Um, But one of the things that I love about the life of Christ in the gospels is that Jesus knew when it was time to just get alone with the heavenly father. He, he knew when it was time. It, it, you know, Jesus, uh, Jesus was really a very popular figure back in the day. There were crowds that pushed in all around Jesus. Everybody wanted to hear him teach. They wanted to hear him talk. They wanted to see what miracles he would perform. Some people wanted to push in. They wanted to touch his garment. All of those types of things are happening. And there were just different seasons where Jesus was like, I've had enough. And he would disappear, and everybody would look around and go, where in the world is Jesus? And his disciples kind of learned that rhythm. They they learned when he would and would not be there. But in Luke chapter 4, verse 42, he says this, Early the next morning, Jesus went out to, and here it is, an isolated place. The crowds searched everywhere for him. Jesus had just found this spot. It's like, hey, I'm just going to go and get alone by myself. And you wonder, well, what in the world would Jesus do in a place all by himself? Luke 6, 12 says this. Um, One day soon um, afterward, Jesus went up on a mountain, and here it is, to pray. And he prayed to God all night long. Think about it. I know what you're going. You're going, there is no way that I could pray all night. That's the first thing we do. Well, you're not Jesus, okay? So let me just relieve that from you. You're not him. But here's the really neat thing for those of us who follow Jesus. You see, as a follower of Jesus, you've been invited into a relationship with your heavenly father. So much so, not not just any kind of relationship. You're invited into the kind of relationship where he says, hey, listen, all of the things that are going on in your life all of the things that are heavy on your heart, all of the things that you think about over and over and over and over again, hey, guess what? You can bring those things to me. You're invited into the kind of relationship where he says, hey, I want to hear everything that's going on. You can bring every request, everything that you can ever think or imagine, and you can talk to God about it. That's pretty neat, isn't it? You see, there's a lot of religions out there in the world, but I don't know of one of them that has that type of an invitation from the God that they serve. The God that we serve says, hey, bring every request. Bring everything. So you're someone, and maybe you're you're one of those, and those five things that you 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 um, are symptoms of chronic stress. You're someone who's irritable. And you just begin to bring that. Like, God, I, I'm irritable. These people are just getting on my nerves. Anybody got that? Nobody wants to admit it. Like, they're getting on my nerves. Anxious? Who's anxious? Come on. Just, you just got to breathe sometimes. Like, I just, I'm anxious. Anybody, anybody struggling with depression? headaches, insomnia, and see your heavenly father. This is what's so amazing to me about our relationship with him. Your heavenly father is inviting you 
to bring all of those things and lay them at His feet. All of your cares, all of your concerns, all of your worries, all of your heartaches, all of your brokenness, all of your broken dreams, all of, and He's going, come on, come on. You can talk to me anywhere, anytime, and I will listen. I will listen. I care about what's going on in your life. I care about the things that are heavy on your heart. I care about the things that are racing through your mind. All you have to do is bring them to me. So recently, and when I say recently, I mean last week, we were away with some family. Um, and uh, so when I say family, I mean some extended family. So my brothers um, and their families, and my mom and dad, and then me and my family, and we're all in a cabin together, which let's just be real honest, when you're if a party of seven, which is me and my family, that's enough Okay, and then you add in, you know, everybody else. That there's some there's some anxiousness, there's some irritability going on, and and there was more than one time that I just had to find a quiet place, and I didn't pray all night long, but there were just some prayers that were going up because there were these moments that I'm like, God, I want to smash somebody in the face right now. So can you just give me some patience and help them not to get on my nerves? And you know, it's amazing how just acknowledging that, God, I I am so irritable right now. I don't want to deal with this. I don't want to have to face this. Would you just help me? Would you help me as we go through the day to be an encouragement, even though I don't feel like being an encouragement right now? Does anybody else feel that way sometimes? And that's me. And I just, I just found that that rhythm of prayer gets me through those moments. Now listen, let me just be honest. I'm not someone, like, I don't pray for hours and hours and hours. I know that for me, my rhythm of prayer is that when something gets on my heart and in my mind, I want to send it up. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm one of those people, like if something's weighing on me, I just want to pray. I want to pray about it. I want to, I want to reorient my thinking around the things that are happening. So don't feel like, hey, you've got to set aside like all of this time in the day. That's great if that's the type of person you are. But here's the rhythm. The rhythm is learning to bring all of your cares and concerns and the things that weigh heavy on your heart, all of your brokenness to your heavenly Father. He becomes the one that you turn to. Jesus knew how to do that, and we need to develop that same rhythm. Last thing, and this is probably the hardest one right now, is that we need to develop a rhythm of community in our life. And what do I mean by this? I mean finding fellow followers of Jesus who are going to be people who are going to encourage us, who are going to spur us on, who are going to inspire us. We're we're looking for a community of people that we can be honest with, that we can have these frustrations with, that we can have this talk with. And it's hard right now because things are different. We're not quite as comfortable going into one another's homes because of COVID-19. And, you know, you're having a hard time sharing a meal with someone and small groups aren't meeting quite like they used to meet. And all that stuff's happening. But you know what? You can't stop pursuing community with people in your life. In fact, I would say this. During this season, if you will develop a rhythm of community, it will be that much stronger on the other side of this crisis that we find ourselves in in this moment. Hebrews 10 tells us this, ready? Hebrews 10, let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope that we affirm. For God can be trusted to keep his promises, which by the way, that's just a great encouragement for prayer. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect 
are meeting together as some people do. He goes on, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. I love that. Is anybody reading right now about the end times? Is anybody? I'm actually, I'm actually reading a book about the end times right now, so I'm the only one in the room. But um, everybody throughout history has thought they're living in the end times. New Testament, man, Paul thought it. Paul thought he was going to see the dead. Jesus was coming back. Writer of Hebrews, he's like, hey, the day of Jesus' return is drawing near. And 2,000 years later, we're all standing around waiting. Here we are today. And some people look at the things that are happening in the world right now, and they're convinced that Jesus is on his way back right now. I don't know. I don't have an answer to that. But here's what I do know. Part of the anticipation of Jesus coming back is that we as followers of Jesus would persevere to the end. As we anticipate, there's going to come a day where Jesus is going to return. We want to be ready. How do you get ready? Well, one of the ways that you get ready is that you need people in your life who are going to spur you on, who are going to motivate you to love and good works, so that you will finish the race, so that you will fight the good fight. You need somebody that's going to look at you and say, hang in there. This is just a season. It's temporary, and it's going to be over before you know it. So don't quit. Don't give up. Don't stop believing. Don't lose your faith. You need to keep going. And I would imagine that during this season, that you, at some point, are going to have that moment of crisis. I believe it's going to happen to all of us, however long this season that we find ourselves in last. I believe that every one of us is going to have this moment of crisis, and we're going to need some strong followers of Jesus who are standing around us, who are telling us, keep going. Don't stop. Don't forsake. And that's the thing they said. Don't forsake the gathering together. And gathering together looks different today. But don't stop doing it. You need it. You need the encouragement. I need it. I need the encouragement. I need the inspiration. I need the motivation. And so do you. And so as we realize, hey, hey, we are in this. All of us, we're in this together. And God has great things in store for us in this moment and in the season to come. So don't lose heart and don't give up and begin to establish these rhythms in your life that will help you to become stronger and better followers of Jesus on the other side. Read the Bible, pray, develop community, and see what God does in the middle of it. Can I just pray for you this morning? Hey, listen, I know things are weird, and there's a few of us that are hanging around after the service. If you do need someone to talk to, we would love to just spend a few minutes to talk with you and to pray with you. And if you do have some things that are heavy on your heart, and you just need to just to let it out. Man, we are here we got people that just would love to do that. I'll be there. Several of other pastors just be around in the lobby or outside on the porch just at the end of the service. But we're not finished. So we're going to sing a couple of songs. And uh, two, of the, two songs we're going to sing. One is Waymaker. Waymaker, Miracle Worker. There's some gr- really great words in that. And then the last song that we're going to sing before we dismiss is um, Great is the Lord. And I just love that. I mean, that song builds, Travis, and it just builds there at the end. That all the earth will shout your praise. We have the opportunity to do that. And I know I'm going to put my mask on. I'm going to come down here. And you're like, hey, you're going to sing with the mask on? Yeah, because it doesn't matter. God hears me through the mask. He does. So I just want to encourage you just in these moments. If you're not comfortable with being in a room while we're singing, man, you can can head out one of the doors. You can hang out in the lobby. You'll still be able to hear it. It's all good. But you know, I want us as a church just to turn our attention for a few minutes to the way maker, to the miracle worker, to the one who's above all and greater than all. Because I know that you're facing some things and you're thinking some things and your hearts are heavy. 
And you're invited to the throne of your heavenly father. And he's going, come on. I got this. I got this. And as we sing, as we turn our attention to him, we are reminded he's worthy and he's enough. So why don't you stand up and I'm going to pray. The team's going to lead us in these couple songs before we head out of here today. Father, you are amazing. Amazing. And I thank you for your word, simple truths, the invitation from a heavenly father who loves us and cares so much about us to say, just come on, just bring whatever you have, whatever's on your heart, whatever's on your mind, just bring it. Cast all your worries and all your cares because you care about us. So Lord, I'm, I'm bringing them. I'm bringing them. Things that are heavy on my heart, my frustrations, my disappointments, my shattered hopes and shattered dreams like so many other people in this room. Realizing today, God, that you are enough. You are enough. So we're going to raise our voices through these masks to sing you are way maker, miracle worker. You are great and above all, and we worship you. It's in the name of your great son that we pray. Amen.